All right, let's kick things off. I'm Kevin Martin. I'm the president of Peace Action and Peace Action Education Fund. And Peace Action Education Fund is one of the initiating organizations tonight. And we really appreciate all of you taking time to join us for a scintillating discussion with terrific speakers on debunking deterrence, dangerous deterrence theory, and pursuing nuclear disarmament. So we uh, should have plenty of time for question and answers later. And I really appreciate everybody that submitted questions ahead of time. We'll have our four speakers speak first, and then we will go through the question and answer session. We should have a good 40 minutes or so to do that. So now I'm gonna hand it over to my co-organizer, my good friend and colleague of many years, Dr. Joseph Gerson of uh, the terrific organization, Peace, Disarmament and Common Security. And I was thinking about the title of his organization. And if we achieved peace, disarmament and common security, we probably would have already debunked nuclear deterrence theory. So uh, I, I guess we can play around with that in our heads. But uh, Joseph is gonna lead us in the first section in introducing our fabulous speakers. Joseph, thank you so much for everything you've done for decades and for helping to organize this event and take it away. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and good evening or good morning to those of you who are joining us from Asia and the Pacific. Uh, welcome to our debunking deterrence theory and pursuing global nuclear disarmament. Uh, and just to say it's a pleasure to be working with Kevin and uh, to give give him his due. Uh, doing this webinar was, was his suggestion. Uh, and as we have now 31 co-sponsoring organizations, uh, it seems that we um, uh, we, we've, we've, we've spoken to a need here, and I'm really looking forward to this. For too long, deterrence theory has been used to legitimate the U.S. and other nuclear weapons states, nuclear arsenals, and war plans. The dangerous doctrine is rarely critically examined or questioned, even it is widely recognized that the launch of a single tactical nuclear weapon, say midst the war in Ukraine or in confrontation over Taiwan, could escalate into an omnicidal civilization ending nuclear exchange. Annie Jacobson's new book, Nuclear War Scenario, provides a chilling description of what could happen uh, should deterrence fail, the end of all life as we know it in 72 minutes. UN General Secretary Antonio Gutierrez warns that we are at, uh, at the knife's edge, uh, the knife's edge uh, with the risk of nuclear conflict, as he said, at the heights not seen since the Cold War. Think about that, the knife's edge. And the bulletin of the atomic scientists has repeated that humanity is 90 seconds from apocalypse. We need to take the absence of no first strike doctrines very seriously. Recent Russian nuclear threats remind us that nuclear deterrence theory doesn't guarantee that nuclear weapons cannot be used in war, launched preemptively, or sent off as a result of miscalculations or an accident. In the US, we have the tradition of threatening and preparing to initiate nuclear war to gain battlefield ad advantage or to ensure that no nation will intervene uh, to protect a nation that we are determined to attack. Think Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, even Guatemala. President Putin used the same approach when he warned that he could resort to nuclear weapons were French or other NATO uh, uh, forces deployed to Ukraine. I'll add that I, in, in recent conversations with some fairly senior Russians, uh, they've been clear uh, that were Crimea to be threatened in terms of, of, of Russian control, all bets are off in terms of the possible Russian use of nuclear weapons. The popular understanding of nuclear deterrence is that no power will attack another nuclear weapon state with its nuclear arsenal unless it is attacked first. But who remembers that the initial draft of the Bush-Cheney doctrine for joint nuclear operations was clear, and I quote, the focus of US deterrence efforts is to influence potential adversaries to withhold actions intended to harm US national interests. Our oil, for example, under their SAM. In the past, the US has prepared and threatened to initiate nuclear war to ensure that Saddam Hussein didn't use chemical weapons on US troops as they gathered to decimate his forces. The threat was made in response to Chinese shelling of, tiny, of uh, offshore Taiwanese islands and numerous times during wars and tensions with North Korea. There are numerous ways that deterrence can fail, among them systems failure, 
as when an early warning system misreads a flight of geese, uh, when the wrong cassette is placed in a computer, when a nuclear power's bluff is called, or when a launch signal is mistakenly sent, as happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The truth is that if the human species, our friends, our children, our grandchildren, are to survive, we must debunk and overcome deterrence theory and practice, which serves as the foundation of the existential nuclear threat. Tonight, we are privileged to have four excellent and renowned authorities to do just that. They will each speak for up to 10 minutes, and then Kevin uh, will host our Q&A session. Uh, we'll begin with former Hiroshima mayor, uh, Tadatoshi Akiba. Not content with his degrees in mathematics from Tokyo's elite Tokyo University and from MIT, and after teaching four years at Tufts University, Professor Akiba returned to Japan where he served for a decade in Japan's parliament and then went on to become Hiroshima's mayor from 1999 to 2011. As mayor, he became one of the world's leading advocates of nuclear weapons abolition, including launching the Hiroshima and Nagasaki-led Mayors for Peace, and he traveled the length and breadth of Japan and the world, warning of the nuclear dangers and pressing for meaningful disarmament diplomacy. One of my favorite memories is marching with him and 25,000 others in New York on the eve of the 2010 MPT Review Conference, demanding the full implementation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Tad, the, uh, the forum, the page, uh, the, the webinar here is yours. Take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Joseph, and moderator Kevin, fellow panelists and fellow peace workers. Good morning from Japan. First, I'd like to remind ourselves that there is a hidden assumption we accept when we discuss world issues. And it is that leaders of the world, including those from nuclear weapon states, NWS for short, have minimal common sense. If this assumption loses its reality, we must choose a different approach altogether. Today, my original thought was to outline the 2040 vision, a revised version of Mayors for Peace's 2020 vision However, I would focus on some of its components from the point of view of debunking deterrence theory. Another emphasis will be on Japan and Hiroshima. The deterrence theory is illogical, irrational, immoral, inhumane, and everything else. And as a witness, I offer Jack Chirac, whom I met in the 1990s with Madame Doi. He told us that nuclear deterrence is logically false because no one can refute the following argument. If possessing nuclear weapons guarantees national security, all countries should have should acquire nuclear weapons. Witness number two is Prime Minister Theresa May. During the July 2016 parliamentary debate, the SNP's George uh, Caravan asked her, are you prepared to authorize a nuclear strike that could kill hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children? Prime Minister May replied with one word. Yes. Then continued, the whole point of deterrence is to let our enemies know that we would be prepared to use it. Prime Minister's firm resolve to use nuclear weapons must stem from her belief that the murder of 100,000 innocent enemy citizens would have an infinite weight in the minds of the enemies. At the same time, the same atrocity would be acceptable to her and her countrymen and women simply as an infinitesimal episode. Short of magic, one action causing two such contradictory reactions in people's minds is hard to swallow. Such a contradiction characterizes the deterrence theory. Going back in time to the 1980s, rationally mind people tried to show the world and its leaders what launching a nuclear war would entail by offering convincing predictions and the grave consequences of any use of nuclear weapons. A simplified list goes something like this. A, physicians would not be able to provide even minimal medicine for the victims after a nuclear strike. B, a massive exchange of megaton nuclear weapons between the United States and the Soviet Union would wipe out humanity. At, at the least, it would cause a nuclear winter and humanity would face imminent extinction. C, even the use of 100 or so Hiroshima-sized nuclear devices between India and Pakistan would create a nuclear famine that would starve 
trivial people to death in areas surrounding both countries and possibly in more expensive areas. I believe that the world's public and leaders understand these science-based effects on a global scale. As a result, deterrence theory now limits its scope to using only Hiroshima-sized or smaller nuclear weapons. That is why the 2016 British parliamentary discussion and President Putin's threat fall within this scope. Prime Minister May and President Putin also raised another critical point, the personal responsibility of the person pressing the button. President Putin's threat to use nuclear weapons, though most likely it was not his intention, made viewers of the evening news realize that there is a culprit to the atrocities they watch. Adding the angle of accountability makes our job of convincing nuclear weapon states and their leaders not to use even smaller sized nuclear devices more effective. To show them what they would be held accountable for, we need to remind them of the sufferings and inhumanities that the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings have caused. The moral dimension and accountability question also strengthen the TPNW's legal power. The heaviest burden is on the United States, the only country that had used nuclear weapons in war, as President Obama reminded the world, and Japan, the only country that knows the reality of nuclear war. However, they have been complicit in avoiding the issue of morality. In a simplified scenario, they both adhere to the myth that the sneaky attack on Pearl Harbor started the war and the righteous A-bombs ended it. This myth has successfully hidden the moral dimension of history from the public's eyes. Hidden are the war responsibility of Emperor Hirohito and the morality of ultimate violence. A recent Sisla Park agreement between the Pearl Harbor National Memorial Park and Hiroshima Peace Park, which was forced on the citizens of Hiroshima suddenly, is an example of the two governments, not forgetting the hidden agenda. Now, let me concentrate on Japan. Japan has been a docile servant to the U.S. nuclear policy and an active blocker of the U.S. policy change. Here are a few examples. A, in July 2017, the Japanese ambassador to the United Nations declared before anyone else that it would neither sign nor ratify TPNW. The Japanese government thus sent a clear signal to all nuclear weapon states and dependent states that it was okay to oppose the abolition of nuclear weapons. It is the moral stamp of approval from the only abled country in history. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe bluntly told the Obama administration that he opposed the idea of no first use being considered by Obama in 2016. The G7 summit in Hiroshima adopted the final document, the Hiroshima vision. It endorsed deterrence theory. For many innocent people, the name Hiroshima is now an official endorser of deterrence theory. Instead, what if Prime Minister Kishida, who calls himself the Prime Minister from Hiroshima, flew to Moscow to persuade President Putin to declare he will not use nuclear weapons, or invited him as a special guest to Hiroshima to show him the Avon Museum? Ditto to Prime Minister Netanyahu. The spirit of Hiroshima, together with the city's solid and stable stance, long influenced the government's persistent pro-nuclear weapons attitude. Unfortunately, in recent years, this role Hiroshima has played so effectively has eroded considerably. Here are a few examples. A. From 2011 to the present, Mayor Matsui of Hiroshima appointed ex-Foreign Ministry officials as the head of the Peace Culture Foundation. The foundation is responsible for formulating and executing Hiroshima City's peace policy, including drafting the peace declaration. Historically, retired anti-nuclear journalists or active peace workers held the position. In 2023, the city's Board of Education deleted P.F. Gien, a famous cartoon by Hibakusha cartoonist from its peace reader. The Peace Declaration of 2023 last year embraced the Hiroshima Vision's central concept, the deterrence theory. Still, it also announced that the deterrence theory is bankrupt because some world leaders threatened to use these weapons. Again, what if the city of Hiroshima invited President Putin to Hiroshima or went to Moscow to persuade him, even if the prime minister is unwilling to do so? Finally, there are some optimistic signs. 
with the Labour Party in control, Scotland will likely propose gaining independence from Great Britain to become a non-nuclear weapons country. Also in Japan, since the Kishida administration seems desperate enough to try anything to raise its popularity, given enough pressure, he may request his cabinet members to visit Hiroshima and Nagasaki for the first time to learn about the Hibakusha's experiences and messages. As you saw, there is a vast gap between what Japan and Hiroshima could and should do and the harsh reality I just reported. We are working toward launching a new and realistic plan to fill that gap on August 6 next year, the 80th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Please help us accomplish this goal. Oh, thank you very much. Mayor Akiba, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I think most people here in the United States have very little understanding of, um, you know, of, of the role of, of the Japanese government in really reinforcing U.S. preparations for nuclear war uh, and in really mis misrepresenting uh, the lessons of, uh, of, of, of the A-bombings. And I look forward to the questions that, um, that, that we'll have for you that are or many participants have. I'm looking here at the number 287 people at the moment. Let me then uh, turn to Elaine Scarry. Uh, Elaine teaches at Harvard University, where she is the Cabot Professor of Aesthetics. Among her works is Thermonuclear Monarchy, which demonstrates that nuclear weapons and democratic governance are mutually exclusive. Beyond demonstrating the extraordinary dangers of first strike nuclear uh, doctrines, uh, and uh, and that the nine nuclear monarchs uh, hold the fate of humanity uh, in their hands. She also maintains that they have the political tools needed to dismantle their country's nuclear architecture, and they also have the obligation to do so. Elaine has been elected to the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has received numerous honors and awards and was named as one of the top 100 leading U.S. intellectuals. No captive of the Ivory Tower, Elaine serves on the board of the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security, and she is very active with the Massachusetts Peace Action's Nuclear Disarmament Working Group. Elaine, thank you for all that you do, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Kevin, and fellow speakers, and to all of you who are participating. I want tonight to devote my 10 minutes to just describing the response to deterrence by General Lee Butler, who, as you probably know, is the former commander in chief of the United States, <clears throat> United States Strategic Command. In addition to being commander in chief of the United States Strategic Command, General Butler was director of the Joint Strategic Target Planning Staff. So his voice is one that's coming to us from the deep interior of our country's nuclear architecture. For example, in the year the Berlin Wall fell, his particular job was to serve as director for strategic planning in the office of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So this is somebody who could be crowing about his success in overseeing uh, nuclear deterrence. And instead, what he gives us is an impassioned denunciation of deterrence theory. Uh, General Butler says that deterrence, nuclear deterrence is premised on a litany of unwarranted assumptions, unprovable assertions, and logical contradictions. He identifies, as I see it, eight flaws in the mindset of deterrence. Number one is the fact that deterrence contradicts the first obligation of the military and the first obligation of national security which is to ensure the survival of the nation. He doesn't just say that they don't live up to that. He says that they starkly contradict it. Uh, and I, it leads him to say that it's our greatest responsibility to rethink nuclear deterrence. The second flaw is the fact that, uh, that nuclear deterrence is fatally flawed on the level of human psychology. He says that it's premised on the idea that each side can understand the position of the others. And yet in reality, each has very little understanding and in many cases makes very little even attempt to understand 
what the other side is doing and saying. He deplores the fact that we take Western reasoning and rationality as a model for a situation that is hideously complex and terrifying and gives rise to uh, all kinds of panic and, uh, and, and fear. Um, now, it's, it's the case that, that one of the leading proponents of nuclear deterrence theory, uh, Thomas Schelling, um, points out that, that uh, deterrence is often wrongly accused, in his view, wrongly accused of being hyper-rational. And yet, when you listen to Thomas Schelling's often very brilliant interviews on YouTube, you see that each time somebody presents him with a scenario that could entail the breakdown of deterrence theory, he says, but that would be foolish, or but that would mean that people had misperceived one another. Um, and, and, uh, and yet that's exactly what happens in the fog of war. People do misconstrue others' intentions. Number three in uh, General Butler's uh, denunciation is a, de a flaw in deterrence theory that um, comes from the fact that if it fails, um, it's, it, the consequences of that failure are intolerable. General Butler says that in conventional war, if uh, deterrence fails, there, you will, of course, suffer. You may lose a battle. You may lose the war. Um, you, you may have your country uh, change governance. But you don't have what you have if deterrence fails. And that is that uh, the whole earth, he says, is poisoned and inhabitants are deformed from generation to generation. Not only the fate of nations, but the very meaning of civilization, he writes. Are, are in jeopardy. I think that his point here is very clarified by an observation made by a sociologist at Yale named Charles Perrault, who points out that every device, every object, every process in the world has some moment in which it will break down, even if only for a short time. And therefore, what you don't want is any object or any device or any process that in the event that it breaks down is going to be catastrophic. And exactly what nuclear deterrence uh, is, is a process that if it breaks down is going to be utterly um, fatal. Um, the fourth flaw in, the, uh, in deterrence theory is the fact that uh, there's a, a tremendous contradiction at its heart. Uh, General Butler says that deterrence relies on the specter of a huge second strike. If my opponent wants to use a first strike against me, he will be discouraged when he sees that even after that strike, I have an arsenal that can deliver massive retaliation, or at least retaliation far beyond uh, what was suffered. But here is the contradiction. To my opponent, this mighty second strike arsenal that I've amassed looks an awful lot like a first strike arsenal. And fearing that I might deliver a massive first strike, um, my opponent now has to vastly increase their own second strike uh, uh, arsenal, which looks to me like a first strike arsenal. And so the very point of deterrence, which was to dissuade people from first use by showing the strength of second use, um, turns over in a somersault and just gravitates once more towards, um, towards first use. It also has another consequence, consequence, which leads directly to the fifth flaw, and that is that it, uh, it accelerates, it, uh, it, it increases the uh, composition of US and Soviet forces and the forces of other nuclear states. That is rather than placing rational limits on for nuclear forces, it gives rise to an insatiable arms race. Now, General Butler repeatedly calls out the greed and obscene appetite of weapons contractors. And he also remarks on the competition between Navy and Air Force for which one will get to be preeminent in the nuclear array. He also shows that what proliferates are bureaucracies and processes. He writes that there are astronomically expensive infrastructures, monolithic bureaucracies, and complex processes which just defy one's comprehension. Um, 
to enhance rather than constrain application is the outcome of nuclear deterrence. And he says that as he witnessed weapon after weapon being contemplated through every corridor, and now I'm quoting, through every corridor, in every impassioned plea, in every fevered debate about a given weapon, rang the rallying cry, deterrence, deterrence, deterrence. So the drive for new weapons, again, comes from greed, comes from competition, comes from the uh, wish to create ever more ingenious forms of massacre, but it also comes from that paradox between first use and second use that I described earlier. The sixth law is the profound moral aberration of deterrence. Uh, General Butler points out that it can't possibly be legitimate and appropriate to respond to a nuclear weapon by then launching a nuclear weapon at the uh, opponent's population. What target, he writes, could warrant such retaliation? Would we hold an entire society accountable for the decision of a single demented leader? Closely related to this sixth law is a seventh law. Deterrence destroys the ability of both individuals and groups to think clearly. Um, he says that deterrence theory and game theory are made up of rhetorical parlor tricks and verbal sleights of hand that disable our ability to think. They corrode our sense of humanity, numb our capacity for moral outrage, and make thinkable the unimaginable. That's their effect on individuals who keep bandying the term deterrence about. But it also uh, harms planners who should be using their mental abilities to scrutinize situations, uh, to debate, to deliberate, and instead are in this, uh, what one philosopher describes as tit, to tit for tat game of uh, deterrence. The eighth flaw is the one that Tad mentioned at the very opening of his talk, namely deterrence theory promotes, promotes pro proliferation internationally. If we think deterrence makes the world safer, then many other countries should adopt it as well. Gen General Butler says, while we continue to espouse nuclear deterrence and to celebrate it as an irreplaceable element in our security, other nations are listening and are being converted to our theology. So General Butler describes deterrence as a framework that prepares the way for apocalypse. It must be challenged, it must be refuted, he says, but most important, it must be let go. Thank you. Elaine, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, you know, I find myself uh, looking forward to having the written text uh, that we can uh, not only distribute to people here, uh, but to be posting so that they can do their work uh, more more broadly in the world. Uh, let me now turn to uh, introduce my friend and longtime colleague, Jackie Cabasso, who has served since 1984 as the executive director of the Western States Legal Foundation. Also, she served as the North American coordinator of Mayors for Peace, co-convener of United for Peace and Justice National Coalition, and she is the founding mother of the International Abolition 2000 Network. She has been an advocate and organizer for nuclear disarmament, for nonviolence, and environmental protection for 40 years. Her work encompasses local grassroots activism, including nonviolent direct action, advocacy, organizing, and networking at the national and international levels. Uh, Jackie's research and analysis have been published in numerous articles and books. Uh, she's no slouch as an organizer. As part of her work with Mayors for Peace last month, she led the U.S. Conference of Mayors to adopt a resolution calling for urgent action to avoid nuclear war, resolve U the Ukraine conflict, lower tensions with China, and redirect military spending to meet human needs. Jackie, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Joseph and Kevin, for inviting me. It's really um, an honor to be part of this distinguished panel. So I'll just fill in a few, a few points about deterrence. The Latin root of the word deterrence means to frighten away, fill with fear. In other words, to threaten. 
Deterrence undergirds entire military industrial establishments and the national security states and elites they serve. It is an elastic ideology which has outlived its Cold War origins and is twisted and turned by nuclear armed states to justify the perpetual possession and threatened use, including first use of nuclear weapons. In the US, national security policy has been remarkably consistent in the post-World War II and post-Cold War eras. Nuclear deterrence, the threatened use of nuclear weapons, has been reaffirmed as the cornerstone of US national security by every president, Republican or Democrat, since 1945, when President Harry Truman, a Democrat, oversaw the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Unfortunately, Russia and other would-be superpowers have increasingly fashioned their own national security policies on the U.S. model. As described in a 2008 U.S. Department of Defense report, nuclear deterrence is achieved by credibly threatening a potential adversary with the use of nuclear weapons so as to prevent that adversary from taking actions against the United States, its allies, or its vital interests. This is accomplished primarily by maintaining sufficient and effective nuclear capabilities to pose unacceptable costs and risks upon the adversary should it so act. Now, listen to this. Though our consistent goal has been to avoid actual weapons use, the nuclear deterrent is used every day by assuring friends and allies, dissuading opponents from seeking peer capabilities to the United States, deterring attacks on the United States and its allies from potential adversaries, and providing the potential to defeat adversaries if deterrence fails. In a 2021 article titled Forging 21st Century Strategic Deterrence, U.S. Navy Admiral Charles Richard, then Chief of U.S. Strategic Command wrote, we must acknowledge the foundational nature of our nation's strategic nuclear forces as they create the maneuver space for us to project conventional military power strategically. So you see, you can't just pluck nuclear weapons out of the equation. They play an integral role with conventional weapons. With Russian and Israeli leadership's veiled and not so veiled nuclear threats, Russia and Israel have both been using their nuclear deterrence in this way so far. But it's undeniable that the longer these wars go on, the greater the threats of wider regional conflict and the potential for nuclear escalation become. The Biden administration's October 2022 nuclear post review doubled down on the centrality of nuclear deterrence in U.S. national security policy, declaring, quote, for the foreseeable future, nuclear weapons will continue to provide unique deterrence effects that no other element of U.S. military power can replace. To ensure that these unique deterrence effects are available for the indefinite future, the U.S. is planning to spend $2 trillion over the next 30 years to maintain and modernize its nuclear triad, building new ballistic missile submarines, new silo-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, a new nuclear cruise missile, a modified gravity bomb, a new stealthy long-range strike bomber, and accompanying warheads for each delivery system with modified or new plutonium pits. Pits are the cores of hydrogen bombs. To give some perspective on the scale of this endeavor, at an April 2024 symposium, Na National Nuclear Security Administrator, that's NNSA, Jill Ruby stated, the reestablishment of pit production capabilities is the largest and most complex infrastructure undertaking at the National Nuclear Security Agency since shortly after the Manhattan Project. And... NSA delivered over 200 modernized weapons to the Department of Defense this past year, the most since the end of the Cold War. If, God forbid, Trump becomes the next U.S. president, we can expect an even more aggressive nuclear deterrent stance. This is spelled out in Project 2025, a 900-page report by a coalition of over 100 far-right groups led by the Heritage Foundation, widely seen as a playbook for a second Trump administration. And NATO is a nuclear alliance. As stated on its website, NATO continues to affirm the importance of nuclear deterrence in light of evolving challenges. The 2022 strategic concept states that NATO's deterrence and defense posture is based on an appropriate mix of nuclear conventional and missile defense capabilities complemented by space and cyber capabilities. Again, I want to underscore the integral nature, the, the uh, integration of nuclear weapons into these other weapons systems. 
So watch for reaffirmation of the centrality of nuclear deterrence in statements coming out of this week's NATO 75th anniversary summit in Washington, D.C. Over half the world's population lives in countries whose national security postures explicitly depend on nuclear weapons and the doctrine of nuclear deterrence. In my view, nuclear deterrence is the Gordian knot blocking the path to nuclear disarmament. It's daunting to acknowledge the entrenched power of the forces we're up against, and it's humbling to offer suggestions about what we can do to overcome them. I don't think we can succeed as a single issue movement. I don't think we can rely on celebrities or funders. I think we need to imagine new ways to make common cause with other constituencies based on shared values and vision. And I think we need to build a movement from the bottom up in order to create the political power that will allow for change at the top. I will briefly introduce three initiatives which I believe have the potential to reach out broadly and to build, to help build this kind of a movement. And I'll be happy to elaborate during Q&A. Mayor Surpice, founded in 1982 by the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, is working for a world without nuclear weapons, safe and resilient cities, and a culture of peace. I have served as an executive advisor and North American coordinator for Mayors of Peace since 2007. It was my privilege and pleasure to work with Mayor Akiba until he left office in 2011. During Mayor Akiba's tenure and the 2020 vision campaign he led, membership increased by tenfold to over 5,000 cities in 151 countries and territories. As of July 1st, 2024, membership has reached 8,403 cities in 166 countries and territories. Our next membership goal is to reach 10,000 member cities as quickly as possible. But we also want to deepen the engagement of current members. Second, the Back from the Brink campaign is a US-based grassroots coalition of individuals, organizations, and elected officials working together toward a world free of nuclear weapons and a safer, more just future. Back from the Brink calls on the United States to lead a global effort to prevent nuclear war by actively pursuing a verifiable agreement among nuclear armed states to eliminate their nuclear arsenals, renouncing the option of using nuclear weapons first, ending the sole authority, unchecked authority of any US president to launch a nuclear attack, taking US nuclear weapons off hair trigger, trigger alert, and canceling the plan to replace the entire US nuclear arsenal with enhanced weapons. HRES 77 in the U.S. House of Representatives calls on the U.S. to adopt Back from the Brink's comprehensive policy prescriptions for reducing nuclear risks and preventing nuclear war, and to embrace the goals and provisions of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. There are currently 44 co-sponsors. Finally, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is picking up the unfinished work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., addressing the interlocking injustices of systemic poverty, systemic racism, environmental devastation, militarism in the war economy, and the distorted moral narrative that blames poor people for their own poverty, and weaving them together into one moral fusion campaign, centering the voices of those most directly impacted. When asked about the role of inspiration and intuition in his discoveries, Albert Einstein reportedly said, I am enough of the artist to draw freely upon my imagination. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. Archbishop John Wester of Albuquerque, New Mexico recently wrote, just as imagination enabled Einstein to see the beyond the limits of scientific knowledge, moral imagination can span the seemingly unbridgeable, unbridgeable chasm between the world as it is and the world we so desperately need. By opening our hearts to the power of love and releasing our minds from the chains of fear, it can make a world without nuclear weapons a reality. To achieve the elimination of nuclear weapons in a global society that is more fair, peaceful, and ecologically sustainable, we will need to move from the irrational fear-based ideology of deterrence to the rational fear of an eventual nuclear weapons use, whether by accident, miscalculation, or design. We will also need to stimulate our rational hope that security can be redefined in humanitarian and ecologically sustainable terms that will lead to the elimination of nuclear weapons and dramatic demilitarization, freeing up tremendous resources desperately needed to address universal human needs and protect the environment. In this time of multiple global crises, our work for the elimination of nuclear weapons must take place in a much broader framework 
taking into account the interface between nuclear and conventional weapons and militarism in general, the humanitarian and long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war, and the fundamental incompatibility of nuclear weapons with democracy, the rule of law, and human well-being. And my final comment will be visual. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. so, yep. This is us, okay? <laughs> we need to disregard these guys and tell our own truth. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. That was uh, really excellent, both analysis and 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 recommendations. And, and simply to say, I, I found myself thinking of uh, Ralph Ellison's uh, book, The Invisible Man, uh, one of the seminal American novels, in which he says, all roads lead to the golden day. Well, I don't know quite all roads, but I, I think you know, what you've said kind of uh, lays out the need to be engaging at multiple levels, different movements, uh, to be joining as well as organizing. And to remember that uh, ideas alone are not enough. Uh, we have to organize, organize, organize. So with that, let me um, turn to um, uh, to introduce, excuse me, uh, uh, Emma uh, Emma Claire Foley. I'll get my my identification up here. Let me have a second. Yeah, Emma Emma Claire Foley joined Global Zero, its team uh, at New America in 2018. She now serves as Senior Associate for Policy and Research. Uh, she uh, works for uh, on research relating to nuclear proliferation, risk reduction, uh, and disarmament advocacy efforts. She monitors domestic and international policy developments. Emma Claire received her master's degree from Harvard University's Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies, and her bachelor degree uh, in Russian, uh, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies and History from the University of Michigan. And I think she's also giving us a, a lesson here uh, in commitment and steadfastness as she's joining us well past midnight uh, in Europe. Uh, Emma, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, so I think uh, our other panelists have really covered well um, a pretty expansive critique of the idea of deterrence as it appears in different ways uh, in discourse around nuclear weapons. And I'm gonna add just a couple tiny thoughts to that and then um, take more of the approach of the case study about how this language is applied today um, to one of the nuclear weapons programs that's sort of on the, on the top of everyone's mind, the Sentinel program. Uh, which just yesterday was recertified after uh, revelations that it had gone dramatically over budget. So I'll talk about that. Um, but the first thing that I want to point out as I'm doing this is that um, we're, uh, when we talk about deterrence theory, this, this idea is really baggy, right? That it's not necessarily a theory in the sense um, at least in the sense that it's used, that has you know a clear articulation um, that can then be applied in, in the way that we might think of um, the word theory implying. What it really seems to mean is anything that someone in power who uses it wants it to mean, right? Uh, as we hear it over and over and over as a justification and arguments about nuclear weapons, um, it comes to carry more and more weight and more and more meaning until it becomes effectively meaningless, right? And so kind of what I want to just what I want to demonstrate with my short talk here is how that works and how, you know, one of these actual programs, you know, really fails to serve any aspect of what this word might mean. Um, so to talk about the Sentinel program, um, this is a program that would uh, modernize as we call it, but effectively what that means is replace uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, the land-based nuclear missiles that are kept in underground silos in five states uh, in the Great Plains. Um, they've been there since the early 60s uh, and were initially placed there because of their ability to um, be shot over the North Pole right into the Soviet Union. Um, and they've had a really tremendous effect on the development of the states in which they're based. And I'll talk about that a little bit when I talk about the effects of the program. 
So they've been there for a long time. Um, there's been a multi-year effort to modernize them as part of this comprehensive effort of so-called, again, modernization of the nuclear uh, weapon, the U.S. nuclear weapons arsenal, something that's happening across the globe. Um, and uh, at the time when this came up as a uh, as a project, right, as a potential initiative, it was criticized by many of us here um, and many others as unnecessary and excessively expensive, right? And I want to linger on the unnecessary side rather than in the excessively expensive side, although that's certainly true, um, to kind of tie this into arguments that have been made tonight. Um, we have land-based nuclear missiles that are kept in silos. That means their location is static and known, right? And so um, if we think of them as, a, a, you know, a force that can be used by the United States, they're also a potential target, right? And they're a pretty good target as targets go uh, in that their location is publicly known. It is on Wikipedia, their precise coordinates, right? And you can visit these silos if you want, as I have. Um, and so uh, what we have here, right, and this has been covered in broad strokes by other uh, speakers, but is a situation of profound vulnerability, right? And a situation where um, a president uh, who's, in theory, making a decision about whether to use these tremendously powerful weapons has only a few minutes, right, to decide uh, whether, in fact, to launch a strike. Um, with the information that they might have that a, a strike is coming in, right? So so what this causes is uh, a tremendous risk of an um, accidental first strike. Uh, and once you launch an ICBM attack, um, they cannot be recalled, which means that the um, risks associated with maintaining this force are very high. Um, numerous experts beyond this have argued uh, that any conceivable need uh, to be able to launch a nuclear strike uh, could be met with other uh, nuclear weapons. And yet, um, and, and this is a fact that, you know, you will, you will see acknowledged pretty widely, right, within expert circles of all stripes. You know, certainly the, the experts so, uh, shown in the, uh, the cartoon we just saw, as well as um, something closer to, to what we have here today. And yet, you know, when you look at the um, press release that came out uh, just yesterday, yesterday all of your time and not not mine, uh, about the recertification of the Sentinel program, it does reference deterrence and the necessity of these weapons to, as it says, field a credible and effective deterrent, right? So um, even among people for whom uh, deterrence has a has a precise and Credible, I guess I'll use the word meaning. Um, these weapons have been uh, shown to be uh, extraneous somewhat, and yet, of course, they're, lo they're lumped under this broad umbrella of deterrence um, because, as I've mentioned, right, it's a it's an indicator of of power rather than any actual um, significance of of the or, or any actual future scenario that might be considered using these weapons. Um, so this is a, you know, a general sketch of the more, um, how, how you might talk about these in terms of nuclear weapons strategy. There's a whole other world to talk about with their effect on the lives of the people who live and work around them, right? The program was sold as a uniquely effective economic um, impetus to the area in which it's based, um, which has been as well comprehensively disproven, right? Um, not only has it been shown that uh, comparable um, investments in things like healthcare, education, green energy, all of which are desperately needed um, in these states, some of which are the uh, which are among the least populous in the United States um, and suffer from huge uh, shortages of things like rural health care, elder care, um, educational facilities across the board, really. Uh, so, so investing in any of these things would be much more effective for the long-term economic prosperity and um, just, you know, ability of the citizens of these states to thrive. Uh, and and the funny thing is, when you look at when you when you talk to people in these states, as I have, um, there's an intense awareness of this, right? And um, many cities and 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 states have already begun to effectively plan for uh, disruption in 
the funding that does bring some economic impact uh, when we talk about uh, in replacing this force, which has been based there, um, and around which uh, min major cities and uh, air force bases in this area have have grown and expanded. Um, so we have essentially an argument that's made right for a program that is now 81% over its originally proposed budget. And as I said, right, um, talking about the cost impact of a program like this is not necessarily the most important thing, but it is certainly important to mention at a time when, um, you know, basic human needs are comprehensively defunded, right? With the justification being a, a lack of funding, right? There seems to be an, an endless well of um, money to support uh, programs like this. Uh, but, you know, on any other level, it's shown to be um, inadequate to serve any purpose it's been designated for. And yet it continues to persist, persist under this label of deterrence, right? This great sort of circus tent covering up um, the actual situation. Um, so I think I will wind down my remarks there. I wanted to add just like one uh, focused uh, example of how this word is used today. Um, and uh, yes, looking forward to people's questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, you know, the um, the Sentinel program and the land-based missiles, right? They're they're not only a sponge, but given their role as a sponge, uh, you know, they're among the, the most dangerous and likely sources uh, of, of uh, you know, first strike warfare in the sense of lose them, you know, use them or lose them. Uh, and I think you've laid out uh, quite clearly, uh, you know, the question about where real security lies. You know, does it lie uh, in, 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 in preparing for uh, the end of life as we know it? Uh, or in providing medical care, housing, and everything else that we really need, real security. With that, I'm going to thank the panel, and, and I'm going to uh, hand the coordination and sharing back to Kevin, uh, and look forward to the questions and the dialogue that follows. Thank you, Joseph, and thanks to all the panelists. And I love what Emma Claire said about deterrence means whatever someone in power wants it to mean. And I think that's exactly why we wanted to do this webinar to address this topic. And uh, I'm not sure if Mayor, Mayor Akiba remembers this, but a few years ago, he and I were on a webinar sponsored by our sister Japanese peace group, Ken Suiken. And at that time, we said, you know, we should do a, a we should do a, an event on debunking uh, deterrence theater, so, uh, theory. So I'm so glad we're doing it today. Now, uh, I really appreciate everyone who submitted questions beforehand. We got close to 100 questions. We won't be able to address them all tonight. That would eat into Emma Claire's sleep, and it would be lunchtime for Mayor Akiba by the time we got through all of them. But I will group together a, a few that I've reviewed and that I think are uh, some of the most uh, important questions. So here are a few that are grouped that I grouped together. Joe Scarry asked, in today's mainstream discourse, where is the main place ordinary people absorb, and I think that's a good word for it, the quote unquote gospel of deterrence? And then Cheryl Spencer asked, what we what would replace uh, deterrence theory if we moved away from that? And Danny Hall asked, what are the most uh, important arguments against deterrence? that could be effective with members of Congress and their staff and in communities where jobs are supported by the nuclear weapons industry. So those are a few that I grouped together and uh, be glad for any of the panelists to take uh, a stab at answering any of those. Um, well, I would say uh, to at least one of those, uh, what might replace deterrence theory? I mean, I think what it would be replaced by was like would be a more realistic view of how um, the United States and other nuclear weapons countries wage war. Um, we get this constant argument that nuclear weapons have been the sort of um, you know name brand war preventer, right? There's a graph that comes out a lot. Uh, in, in congressional hearings where it says like war high, war low, right? Before and after nuclear weapons that many of you I'm sure have seen. 
Um, but we've also what we're also seeing today is nuclear weapon states waging war um, using conventional means, right? Massive conventional uh, means. And uh, nuclear weapons are obviously a part of that at the rhetorical and sort of strategic level, right? Uh, as they're constantly mentioned and like used, you know, in one of their main capacities as a threat. Um, but it does give the lie to this idea that they're preventing war in some meaningful sense. Um, and so I think that, um, as I said a little bit in my talk, right, deterrence has become so overused as a concept to the point that, um, you know, I, I can remember, right, like being in, in high school and like learning for the first time about nuclear weapons through like a debate team case um, and seeing, you know, how the logic can kind of just means, right, like defense in some way um, or uh, pre presenting, you know, a, a sense of yourself as able to defend yourself in the most generic possible way. I think it's very possible that this idea um, could be could fade away from public discourse were it not con constantly encouraged and constantly built up uh, through a number of means. And I'll leave it to other pass uh, other panelists to talk about what those means are and, and anything else. So again, anyone else want to address either how the public absorbs it or what are good arguments with members of Congress and their staff or communities that are dependent on nuclear weapons spending? Those are tough. Jackie and then Elaine. Yeah. Um, the American public and cut publics in some other countries as well have been hammered with the single message that national security is is ensured through military, through overwhelming military might, and that there's it, no cost that would be too expensive for that. And we need a paradigm shift. We need a paradigm shift, which is we have got to, and we are at the, I think, at an inflection point in history. I mean, I really do think we have got to get ordinary people to reconceptualize security in terms of human security, the security of individuals everywhere, uh, regardless of their country, um, regardless of their circumstances. And that requires a whole different set of security mechanisms. Now, that can also be approached hand in hand with common security, which is something Joseph works on a lot, where you get countries to agree to, you know, they might not like each other, but they might agree to recognize that they're they're they have mutual interests which are uh threatened if they are at war with each other. And I and I think that there needs to be a kind of bottom up realization of this and a demand, a demand for this new kind of security paradigm. And I do see that coming partly through the uh, some of the campaigns that I mentioned. As I said, the Marist of Peace is, now, is not single issue now. Yes, it's calling for the global elimination of nuclear weapons, but also promoting safe and resilient cities and a culture of peace in which peace is a priority for every individual. That's part of how we get there. The Poor People's Campaign is a total moral fusion campaign that they're, they're gonna be now launching a four-month effort to reach 15 million poor and low-wage infrequent voters ahead of this year's election. Um, and there have 17 points. And I'll just read a few of them because I think these all go together. First of all, abolishing poverty is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. Um, a living minimum wage, at least $15 an hour. Voter rights, health care, affordable adequate housing, an end to gun violence fully protected women's rights, environmental justice secures clean air and water, justice for all indigenous nations, fully funded public education, just immigration laws, and addressing militarism in the war economy, standing for peace, not war, an immediate ceasefire in Gaza that allows humanitarian relief, the release of all hostages and peace with justice to be pursued in an end to genocide around the world. Now that's a pretty comprehensive agenda, but it's all, it's all there. And so, any of us who are working on any of those issues, I think, should jump in and lend a hand in this voter outreach because they have done a study showing that uh, if these low propensity, low income voters, low propensity meaning people who don't vote very often, were motivated to vote, that it would it could change the outcomes of, of the elections. Thanks, Jackie. 
Uh, Elaine wanted to address this, and then I have a question for Tad. Yeah, I think that uh, Congress and other people who are used to using this word uh, deterrence ought to have to address the concerns of people who have worked at the heart of the nuclear architecture and who have uh, critiqued it in the way that Lee Butler has, but also in the way that William Perry has and Kissinger and uh, McNamara. Uh, they, they need to come to terms with what it means that people at the very heart of defense have themselves acknowledged that they made a terrible mistake by participating in this and just go through and say, well, what is the reputation? People who uh, think a lot about deterrence theory do think it has a very specific meaning of preventing all conflict by making the cost so high for any participant that they wouldn't dare initiate uh, something. But I think the point is very important that it's a term that's intentionally um, obscure. Uh, it, it is, it, people don't quite understand what it means. It has something to do with defense and yet uh, it's defense that is uh, involves being willing to kill millions of people. It's like the kind of double talk that we hear about from Orwell's 1984. You have something called a peacekeeper missile that is actually designed to obliterate lives. And uh, you keep going in circles. We keep going in circles saying the point of our missiles is we have them so we won't use them, which is just uh, like, just almost speaking nonsense. Uh, if you don't wanna use them, then give them up. And that's the best way to not use them. Um, in, in answer to the question of where does the public uh, dovetail from, from um, Joe, you know, Lee, Lee Butler says that public, uh, private conscience, individual conscience is going to be very important in returning to a world that doesn't rely on uh, deterrence. And you can see right now that many good people really believe that nuclear weapons have kept us safe. Um, one strategist, the one I mentioned earlier, Thomas Schelling, in his Nobel Prize winning speech, uh, said that maybe the greatest event in the 20th century is that a nuclear weapon wasn't used. Um, and you often hear people saying the nuclear weapon hasn't been used. And what they don't add is, had it been used, we would not be having a conversation. We would be crawling along on a on an earth covered with ashes. So it's not just a casual uh, you know, question of whether we have or don't have uh, the use of, of nuclear weapons. As well as public ignorance of all the near misses when an accident, a miscalculation could have brought life uh, to an end on earth. I was born just after the Cuban Missile Crisis, November of 1962, and my mother thought I was never going to be born. So I have a question for Tad, but this is something that Joseph and Jackie and I, I know, have also worked on a lot, which is uh, Asian security and particularly the questions of uh, security vis-a-vis -vis North Korea and China. And uh, one of the pan or excuse me, one of the questions, and I'm, I'm grouping a few questions here. One of the questions was, well, North Korea is sometimes cited as a successful example of deterrence, and I'm not sure what they meant by that. That North Korea because they have nuclear weapons, deters others from attacking, or North Korea is deterred from attacking by the United States nuclear weapons and Japan and South Korea being under the nuclear umbrella. There's different ways you could look at that. Um, but then also the question of, of China, because China has always had in the past a minimal deterrent, but is now moving to something that looks like it will be enhanced more than a minimal deterrent. And I wanted to ask Mayor Kiva to take the first shot at answering those questions, which are difficult ones, I, I admit. Okay, um, let me tell you uh, first, uh, what's going on in Japan, okay? Uh, and then, you know, that perspective, living within Japan is quite different from the sort of uh, frame in which the, the question was posed. Okay, in Japan, whenever North Korea tests a missile or a rocket or whatever, 
okay, your iPhone will ring loudly and just uh, declaring danger and danger. And in this case, that, that's the public uh, television tells you to find a shelter, you know, hide in a concrete building or go to some place that's safe because North Korea has just launched a rocket. Okay, that's the threat. Um, and I don't think that it's it's such a um, such a great uh, threat either because Japan also launches rockets, um, not on a daily basis, but certainly uh, yearly basis, some of, some of which uh, actually fail. But anyway, under those circumstances, uh, and uh, Emma was right by saying that um, deterrence means whatever those in power want to mean. And uh, so they their argument goes in both ways. So you know, some of, of the people who uphold deterrence as the ultimate policy that Japan should take and actually starts arguing, you know, just do you think that the United States will really protect Japan from North Korea by attacking North Korea with nuclear weapons? And you know, they th then they advance, no, the United States will not take that risk. Okay, then the proponents of uh, Japan's uh, nuclear uh, um, arsenal uh, pro promoter, they then say, okay, that's why we, Japan, should possess nuclear weapons. Okay, but they don't want to throw away uh, the so-called nuclear umbrella uh, because we need protection uh, when Russia attacks Japan. But then the same argument can be repeated, but then the conclusion is that Japan should possess nuclear weapons. But however, that when you look at that kind of action or voice, strong voices or uh, opinion forging within Japan, when you look at that from the Chinese side, it'll you know, give a completely different message. Because as I said, that uh, Abe and even Kishida administration are opposed to the policy of no first use. In other words, if Japan possesses nuclear weapons, that means Japan's attitude is that Japan will take the first strike policy. Now, China has, since uh, it has possessed uh, nuclear weapons, Chinese policy has been no first use. Now, faced with that, from, from China's point of view, which does not want to use nuclear weapons first, then you know, faced with the Japanese attitude that Japan is going to, you know, just to take up the nuclear policy with the first strike policy at, at its foreground. Now that's a confrontation, and uh, many Chinese still believe that the Japan has not you know, atoned its uh, you know crimes and sins uh, in. World War II and in the 30s and 40s and so forth. So, you know, given that situation, China fears Japan possessing nuclear weapons and that increases tension extremely. And so easing that actually uh, should be initiated by Japan. Now, for example, Japan does not have any diplomatic relations with North Korea which is just across the sea from Japan. And that's ridiculous. You know, no matter what happens, the first thing that Japan should be doing, making an effort, is to at least have a diplomatic ties with North Korea. Well, recognize, you know, just each, each other. And it, it is Japan that should take the initiative. And that kind of diplomatic actions lacking, you know, talking about possessing nuclear you know, weapons on its own is extremely, you know, dangerous. And that's the most uh, disabling, um, destabilizing factor in Northeast Asia, I think. Okay, despite the fact that uh, there has been a severe effort to uh, forge the uh, Northeast Asia nuclear weapons free zone uh, with the idea of three plus three, that is uh, Korea, Japan and the United States as the um, three sort of core countries with surrounding Russia, uh, North Korea, and China as the surrounding countries and forging 
a six uh, country you know treaty to stabilize the situation and uh, making that area nuclear weapons free and i think it's a great idea but the reality is so far away uh from its objective and idealistic uh sort of ideas that uh, the civil society has been advancing well, I nominate you to be the first Japanese advancer, uh, uh, ambassador to North Korea. So I, I don't know how busy you are these days, but uh, you, you'd be the man for the job. Uh, I'm going to ask a question because this has come up, uh, I know, in some of the work that is happening in Congress that I monitor and others do too. Uh, this is from the Q&A. Uh, uh, what effects might the further use of AI, artificial intelligence, have on our safety from nuclear accidents and nuclear attacks? including attacks launched in response to a non-existent first strike, which is just a brave new world question that makes my brain hurt, but I know it is on people's minds. And there are efforts in Congress, and I don't know the current status of it, but to uh, ensure that there couldn't be a robot-generated nuclear war, that, that AI could not start a nuclear war. Does anybody else have more in, in information or intelligence on that? Yeah, I do. Okay, please. Okay. My mentor is Joseph Weizenbaum, uh, who was who created the program, first AI program called ELIZA, which mimicked the psychoanalyst and actually became a sensation at the time in the 1960s. But he warned that the AI will take a position that uh, we human beings should not allow the machine and computer and software uh, to assume. So he said that, that there is a clear, there should be a clear distinction between humans and machines. And there are things that human beings should not let machines, computers, AIs do, even if they are capable of doing. And one thing that uh, our AI could easily do is to replace human decision making, but without any accountability. Okay, just in this presentation, I try to press the point that there is a person responsible for starting a nuclear war. That's a moral responsibility. And although it's a wrong decision to press the button, that under the current uh, situation, we'll still have the capability of who actually does that. Okay, and US president, the Russian president, or other people who have the authority to press the button. But in the AI age, it, it is possible that the entire decision is related to AI and nobody knows who actually made the decision. AI is, is so complicated and you just don't know what's going on behind the scene. So there could be a network which nobody knows of AI to AI behind the scenes. So, you know, two countries uh, co corroborating uh, under carpet where nobody really knows. So who actually pushed the button could never be known. And of course, you know, when we, the entire humanity is gone, nobody cares actually who did it. But still, I believe it matters for all of us, for all our survival to hold people accountable for their actions and for a grave consequence like uh, human ex extinction, uh, I think we should build a system. We should keep the system so that the accountability still means something. The moral de decision still means something for uh, human beings. So conceding important parts of uh, military decisions, political decisions, and other decisions that the uh, human beings you know, have cherished you know, uh, actually giving that up to AI is something we should never do. And the world should, you know, cooperate with, with each other to make sure that there is transparency, you know, about who is making a decision to give that human power to computers. Right now, the, the private corporations who are working for profit are creating AI programs, which are convenient and they're selling to everybody. And people, you know, because they're cheap, are buying them, utilizing them, but you don't really know what you're buying. You may be, you know, brought into the world, you know, where 
decisions you think you've made was actually made by, by someone else. You are, and you are simply a puppet in that whole machine. So the entire world should be aware that the AI has that danger and we should really build up a, a you know, clear political system and moral system to address that issue. Anyway, Joseph Weizelman wrote a book, uh, Computer Power and Human Reason in 1976. And I recommend that you read it. Uh, and uh, because it's a classic, but it addresses the point I'm trying to explain to you more eloquently and more precisely. I hadn't even thought of AI systems in one country and another country communicating with each other to start a war. So now you've actually made me more worried. But uh, Peace Action and other organizations will keep everybody apprised of efforts in Congress to uh, make sure that that can't happen. One of the questions that I, I really resonated with that came in early was um, questions about the, the notion of patriarchal systems of power that certainly relate to the war system, to nuclear weapons, to deterrence. And I wonder, and I guess the question for me is, is, is that something that we under promote? Because I mean, if you look at peace action, most of our most ardent supporters are women and men who might consider themselves feminists and who are against the patriarchal system of power. And, and I guess, I don't know that it needs to be so much analyzed, but is that something in terms of our organizing that we don't emphasize enough that nuclear weapons, the war system and notions like deterrence are, are undergirded by patriarchal notions of power in the world? Elaine? Yeah, I think that that is a very uh, interesting idea to contemplate. I've always been mystified by why uh, the feminist movement has not given more attention to what is almost an all male creation. The nuclear, the nuclear arsenal is, is almost uh, an all male creation. And uh, it may well be, I think that really is an important question to ask and one that we shouldn't necessarily jump into, but we should deliberate about and see whether that would be uh, a promising idea. It might be able to awaken people who aren't at present worried about the, uh, or don't see it as their responsibility to worry and it might, uh, it might actually make them feel connected to it, to recognize the uh, the, the the kind of you know th all male uh, thinking in this this aggressive framework. Anyone else want to take? Go ahead, Jackie. Yeah, I have I have a lot of difficulty with this one because. It's it, you have to be very careful in s distinguishing between people of different genders and a feminist philosophy or or in policy. And I am constantly distressed by the in growing numbers of women who, in fact, are in horrible warmongering positions. A lot of the nuclear weapons establishment now is led by women. Jill Ruby, who I quoted, the National Nuclear Security Administration person. Um, is is a woman uh, and very hawkish. We've you mentioned uh, Theresa May. I mean, we've had lots of examples come up, and so I think it needs to be thought through in a in a careful and 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 thoughtful way. Because if you just put it pit it as a gender based thing, it doesn't get us anywhere. Well, I agree with that, and that's why I think you're talking about systems of power and. Yeah. That's that's how you frame it, and, and Elaine's right. The, these were creations for the most part of men, um, but that doesn't mean that if you anymore women, doesn't mean if you put women in. Yeah, there's a lot of you know under secretary of this, that, or the other thing in the Pentagon now. Exactly. All right, we are going to be closing very uh, soon. Oh, Tad, Tad, did you want to answer that yeah, too? Yeah, just on that subject, uh, that reminded me of uh, Dr. Helen Caldicott's uh, writing. She wrote a book. You know, pre precisely on that uh, point, you know, just uh, all these uh, missiles, nuclear weapons, and everything else as a phallic symbol. And uh, I think maybe we should go back to that classic to 
start of a thinking, you know, rethinking of the subject. <laughs> okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask about was uh, concrete uh, examples, and Jackie had mentioned some earlier, and the mayor had talked about uh, upcoming next year on the anniversaries of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, of campaigns that can move us forward, if not specifically to debunk deterrence theory, then to move towards disarmament. And so we talked about Sentinel a bit, and that the demand really is not just to cancel Sentinel, but to get rid of the land-based uh, uh, ICBM, that, that leg of the nuclear triad. If anyone wants to, to offer any comments about those kinds of things uh, as we are wrapping up, that would be most welcome. Well, I already did. Yes, you did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, if there's nothing else on, on that specific, uh, okay. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, again, let me report on the Japanese situation. The um, you know most of the Japanese uh, local governments, you know, just I, I mentioned that uh, Hiroshima City's uh, peace policy being dominated by the foreign ministry officials. However, that's not limited to Hiroshima. You know, most of the heads of local governments in Japan are the um, the retired top level high government officials from the central from Tokyo. So the the local government's you know policies to a large extent by just an extension of the national government's policy. And uh, you know that has been going on. And in the recent, you know, Tokyo election, uh, the the incumbent governor Koike won, but you know she was backed by the Liberal Democrats, you know, which is the dominant party. Now, we need to change this political situation in Japan to change the Japanese government's nuclear policy. Okay, and no one else can actually do it well. Actually, the, you, you can. The Japan has been known to be sensitive to pressures from foreign countries, not just governments, but people saying good things and bad things about Japan from abroad. The Japanese public you know, has been quite sensitive to that. So if you pay a little bit more attention to what's going on in Japan and voice your opinion you know, just in one way or the other, I believe that will help our efforts toward democratizing our Japanese politics and especially that in local governments and especially the government in, in Hiroshima to sort of bring our ideal into reality by formulating a, well, a 2040 vision, which I'm, I'm calling and I, I'm hoping that something like that will be created by August 6th uh, next year, so that we will know that the future generation will be on the right path. So anyway, I need your help in that regard. And we will do so. And of course, many of us have worked closely with the Japanese Peace Group over the decades. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to say thanks to Jeff Jurgens from the Peace Action Staff, our communications director, who did such a great job helping to promote this event and on the tech side to the 31 organizations uh, that helped to co-sponsor. And we hope to replicate this in the future. Joseph, is there anything you would like to say to help close us out tonight? You know, I guess two two things. I mean, the, the one piece is organize, organize, organize. Uh, you know, that, that uh, analysis is necessary, uh, but without organization and social movement, it doesn't change policy. And we've got to be focused on changing policy uh, so that we can prevent nuclear cataclysm. Uh, I guess the other is that I'm looking forward to uh, having the recordings uh, of, of this of this uh, webinar, uh, which we can circulate not only to uh, all those who participated, but certainly to our co-sponsors. Uh, and in terms of education and organizing, uh, you know, what better thing to do uh, then to invite friends or have your local organ organization uh, take a look at this webinar together, have a conversation, and think about what you can and should do next. 
So that's 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 my that's my response. And just to to thank to thank all of our speakers. Uh, and I think I want to send a special thank you to Mayor Kiba, who I think who among other things has maybe helped our audience and our movement understand that the peace constitution in Japan uh, is ignored by its government. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that if we're going to move forward, it's going to take international cooperation uh, between our movements in the United States and Asia uh, and, uh, and uh, Europe and the global south. Um, and uh, so organize, 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 defeat Sentinel and uh, work for peace and justice and the climate together. Thank you, everyone, and particularly to our panelists. You were all fabulous and this couldn't have gone better in my little half-baked idea of how this event would go. So much better. Thank you all so much. Emma Claire, really, I hope you get to sleep soon. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody.